I'm Terry Metzger. I'm currently the chairman of the Anti-Drug Coalition here in Tuscarawas County, and I'm here to serve as the moderator for tonight's forum. Well, first I want to welcome each and every one of you uh, here tonight to this Medical Marijuana Forum sponsored by the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition. The mission of the coalition is to unite citizens and stakeholders of Tuscarawas County with the goal of preventing youth substance use. The purpose of this forum is not to take sides as to, for, to be uh, for being uh, for or against uh, medical marijuana, but to provide education and awareness of the medical marijuana program established here in the state of Ohio. As a very brief history, the medical marijuana program was established by law by the state legislature and signed into law by Governor Kasich in 2016. Uh, it took three years until uh, January of this year, 2019, for the program to become operational. So it's been operational now for about two and a half months. The coalition believed it was an appropriate time to hold this forum to educate and to make the public aware of the past and current status of the medical marijuana program and what the future of the program may hold. Let me just go over a little bit of the format of the forum. Uh, first, we'll start off with our presentations from our guest speakers, Marcy Seidel to my right, who is a member of the Ohio Medical Marijuana Advisory Committee, and Dr. Laura, Lori Keeney, uh, uh, MD, a local physician and the Chief Medical Officer and Medical Director of Community Hospice. After the presentations are completed, we will convene a pa our panel for the question and answer period. As you came into the room tonight, you were handed, you should have been handed a 3 by 5 card and a pen and on which you can write any questions you may have. The cards will then be collected prior to the panel discussion and as moderator, I will pose the questions to the panel. We will try to get as many of those questions answered as possible, but the forum will end precisely at 8 p.m. So, with that being said, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Marcy Seidel, who's the Executive Director of Prevention Al uh, Action Alliance. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Miami University in Ohio and is a cert Ohio Certified Prevention Specialist. Prior to her work on the Prevention Action Alliance, she served eight years as Chief of Staff to uh, First Lady Hope Taft and also served on the Senior Staff of advisors to the governor. Uh, before becoming first lady, she served as director of the women's division, uh, or first lady, uh, serving the first lady, uh, she was the director of the women's division of the Ohio Bureau of Employment Services. She serves on many statewide committees, including uh, Governor DeWine's uh, Recovery Ohio Advisory Committee, and as I've mentioned before, the Ohio Medical Marijuana Advisory Committee along with the Coalition of Healthy Communities and the State of Ohio Health Assessment and Health, uh, State Health Improvement Plan Advisory Committee. So without further ado, I give you Marcy Seidel. Inviting me here tonight, and thank you to Carrie and to thank you to uh, Jody. It's, it's always an honor to talk to uh, citizens who are interested <coughs> and wanting to learn about, um, especially about mar <clears throat> marijuana that's being used as medicine in the state of Ohio. Um, we're finding out in many cases a lot of people don't know all the information that they should know. This is a huge public policy shift in the state of Ohio, and in my belief, Believe it will affect every man, woman, and child, even though you may not be taking or using the services of the marijuana program in Ohio. It just has that triple ripple effect. So the more you know, 
the better off each one of us will be. So I, I really am very happy to be here this evening. Marijuana, I just wanted to start out with just the basics. Marijuana has many different names, as you can see up here. <clears throat> Back in the Woodstock days, there was like 1 to 4% THC in the, the marijuana, and that was, back then, everybody was quite concerned about, about the uh, strength of it. But today, the marijuana is a totally different animal, or plant, should I say. It's completely been uh, genetically modified so that there is more THC in it than there's ever before. And right now, the average uh, unit of marijuana has 13 to 35 percent THC in it compared to those many years ago when it was 1 to 4 percent. So that's quite a different item than it is today. One ounce of marijuana seems like nothing. I mean, just an ounce, what can an ounce be? But it's, according to uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, it is about 18 average sized joints. And from that then, at one ounce of marijuana yields those 84 joints, and one joint at a minimum will keep you intoxicated for four hours. And then if you multiply and do the math out, you can be high continually for 14 days, continually, on one ounce of marijuana. So in the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio before even medical marijuana was, was legalized, you, it was decriminalized. And so you could have three and a half ounces on you at any one time and basically no repercussions from that whatsoever. So think about what three and a half ounces was. So when people go, oh, people are going to jail, well, not necessarily, just for having that on them because it's, uh, it was allowed to have that three and a half ounces. It's a very complex plant. So I think a lot of people think, well, marijuana is marijuana, and it's just a single item. Well, no, there are about 84 different varieties of marijuana, or more. They have about 400 chemical compounds in them, and there's about 60 of these cannabinoids, which are the CBD, the CBD that we're hearing a lot about today. That's the unit in marijuana that doesn't get you high and seems to have some promises for medical or therapeutic use. Um, and we also know, and I think it's important to know before we move through, is that marijuana, you can become dependent on it. You can have a marijuana use disorder from it. And the younger you are when you use marijuana, the more likely you are to have that, and more likely you are to have that later on in life. So one out of six youth who use marijuana will become dependent on it. In fact, I have heard, and I'm, you know, through the grapevine, through anecdotal information, is that uh, that's probably the main reason why young people are in treatment today is because of marijuana. Don't know if that's true, but I've heard it many times. The uh, adults, one in 11, will become dependent on marijuana. Well, marijuana is legal in the state of Ohio right now for medicine. Back in 2016, as, as Carrie said, uh, House Bill 523 passed it, and it was legalized on September 8th. I wanted to put this up right away to let you know that there is a toll-free line, and there is also the, um, this, um, this website that you should go to. These are resources that you should use. The, the, web, the um, phone line is for people who are everybody. So if you're a citizen and you have a concern or something that you're interested in about what's happening in your community around marijuana, you can go to it. If you are a patient and using it and something doesn't feel, you just have a question, you can go to that. If you're, I mean, everybody is welcome to use this line and you can get the, hopefully get the answers to your questions. Uh, and then the website it tells you everything that's happening in the marijuana control program. So a lot of what I talk about will be on that program. And you can go back and say, well, what did she say about that? Go to this website, and you can get uh, that additional information. So let's talk about kind of what the basic, basic things are in the, medical wanna, the Ohio Medical Marijuana Program is in Ohio. And first, let me say this. There is nothing different about the marijuana that people use for medicine than the marijuana that you will find on the street to use. Marijuana is marijuana. There is no difference. None. Now, one might have more CBD oil in it, and that would be a, probably a little bit different than what you would find on the street. But technically, I looked at a, a menu of a dispensary 
and it kind of read like a wine list, you know, it's fruity smells and flavors and had really kind of cute little names. But it did tell you what the, mer the uh, THC level was, and all but one out of probably 16 on this list had very sufficiently high levels of THC in them. So uh, that's, that's an important piece to keep in mind. It's a seed to sale system, so the minute the seed is planted, they will track that marijuana all the way through the end to the dispensary. If something happens when a person uses it and they find that something's not right about it, they can go right back to where it was grown. So that's a key thing to it. It uses a tracking system, it's an electronic tracking system. Uh, a state ID card is issued to the individuals who are recommended it. You have to be 18 years of over. Minor patients have to have a caregiver. So if you can be under 18 years old and get it, but your parent or a caregiver has to oversee that uh, process. There's a piece on that too, in many cases, it, in some cases, not many cases, but in some cases, maybe the parent is under 18 years old and they've given a change on that where you can uh, be a young parent and still oversee your child's care. You can't smoke it. That's the biggest thing in the state of Ohio is you cannot technically smoke it. But I'm going to be just as transparent to you. You're going to get bud from the, the dispensaries. What are you going to do with it? If you're in your own home, probably you're going to smoke it. No one's going to come in and arrest you for smoking marijuana in your, your house. I probably shouldn't say that. But, it, but it's not allowed to be smoked, but yet you know, the conditions are there for you to do it. You certainly just wouldn't want to do that out in public. Uh, there's a required to give information to each customer about it. Uh, and at only patients. Caregivers and employees are allowed in a dispensary. So if you're curious about the dispensary down the street or, you know, across town or on the other side, and you want to just go in and see what's happening, you can't unless you have a patient ID card or a caregiver's ID card and go in. So you, you're not allowed to do that. No drive through windows. Uh, these are the types of things that we're going to be monitoring because as this program rolls out and gets a little bit more um, relaxed and, and comfortable in its community, there's going to be, you know, probably a push for drive-through windows, probably a push for delivery systems. And we know that's when diversion will take place. And as a prevention specialist, that's my biggest concern, is that we don't divert this away from patients to the hands of especially younger people. So that will be things we look at. And then everything, whether you're a cultivator, whether you're a dispensary, or you're testing, if you're, um, no matter what, you, as you're involved in this industry, you have to be 500 feet away from what they call prohibited facilities. And that would be schools, libraries, places of worship, parks, things like that. You're just not allowed to be within 500 feet of that. So <clears throat> we just talked about the law. This was the three main things about the law. We won't spend any time on that because we just blew right through all those dates. And it is operational now in the state of Ohio, although it's later than they had hoped, but it is. There are three entities in the state of Ohio that control this program. The first one is the Ohio Board of Pharmacies. And there they oversee the dispensaries, the patients, and the caregivers, and then any new forms of a marijuana that might be used. We have a lot of different forms now, but if there's a different form that may be suggested, they will analyze it with experts to determine that. We have the Ohio Department of Commerce, which is our second place that we would go to that for it. And they oversee the cultivators, those individuals that grow it, the processors who process it into uh, tinctures, into edibles, into vaping type things, that they oversee them. And then the testing laboratories. And there are testing laboratories to determine exactly what's in the marijuana and what the composition of it is. The third entity is the uh, State Board of Me uh, Medical Board. And they oversee the physicians, and they oversee new qualifying conditions. Right now we have 21 qualifying conditions in the state of Ohio, and that's the reason that you can get it. But if there are other ones uh, that want, they want to take a look at, that is the medical board is where that will go. So here we are. Let's start with the cultivators. The cultivators, we have 16 total, what we call level one, which is a fairly large facility that has 50,000 square feet of grow space. Someone asked me the day, other day, how many plants is that? I'm, I don't think there's a number in the plants. It's just how much you can grow within that facility. And if the demand increases, they can go up a half again as much to another 25,000 uh, square feet. Then there's a level two, which is a smaller uh, grow site, which has uh, 6,000 square feet. And again, depending on demand, can go up to 3,000 uh, square feet. Um, Right now, 
their certificate of operations are being given out by the state and they have to meet certain qualifications, certain testing, make sure everything is in its proper place, it does exactly what they said they were going to do in their, their um, um, application. And so there's only eight of those 16 in the first one that have those certificate of operations, and there's only eight in the level two that have it. So we're not at full capacity for growth, but getting there because the Department of Commerce is waiting daily to go out and inspect these sites and give them their operation uh, certificate of operation. So that will grow and continue. These, you can find this on the website. These are the different companies. I don't mean we don't need to spend any time on that. The cultivation, uh, some of the pieces about it is that a cultivator can only have one site. They can't have multiple sites. So this can't be kind of like a, a thing where there's one person that kind of takes over the, the market or the industry here. So if they can only have one license in Ohio. They can't transfer that license without going through the state and the approval process. It's only good for one year and then they have to re-up it right after that. Individuals that work at that site have to be 21 years old and they have to have, there is a precise limit of what the, the fertilizers and the pesticides that can be used on marijuana. So there are certain pesticides that are less harmful, obviously, than others, and they're trying to mitigate any problems that would come from someone who's using marijuana that already has a compromised system and then have that activated with additional problems because of what kind of chemicals they're using. Packaging and labeling requirements. They must do an inventory every weekly, and you cannot, they cannot sell from a growth site directly to the public. Forms and methods. So this is kind of interesting. Here we have, you can take marijuana orally, you can take it topically, so you can have patches, lotions, creams, ointments. Um, you can have a vaporization of it. You can do vaping of plant material. So that's a lot of what was happening right now. You can do the vaping. So it's probably using the e-cigarettes and the vaping pens are probably what we initially started with on it. The thing that's interesting about Ohio is that in any other state, they pretty much say that a, a dose is basically, you can measure it. It's either you know an amount or it's a weight of something. In Ohio, they measure dosages by the potency and the THC in the product. So you can only have tier, they have what they call here tier one marijuana and that is the THC content has to be less than 23% of everything that you take. So if you're taking, you know, if you're getting edibles and you're getting uh, plant material that when whatever your 90 day supply is, it cannot come up to anything more than the 23% unless you go into the tier two and you can get up to 35%. 35% is pretty, <coughs> oh, excuse me, is pretty strong. So you have to be careful about that. Excuse me. So you can see the different forms here. And, and <coughs> excuse me. Okay, the processors, those are the individuals that take it. We can have 40 in the state of Ohio. And only one has their certificate of, of uh, operation right now. They have sort of the same type of things where you have to be within 500 feet. They, they're the ones that transform it into all the different types of products of the tinctures, the oils, the lotions, the edibles, all of those types of things. So once that has gotten started, uh, now in Ohio, we'll start seeing more different types of product hit the, the uh, shelves of the dispensaries. Testing labs. We have five testing labs. They originally started out that they wanted to be associated with universities or public institutions. And um, Central State University and Hawking uh, Technical College were the first two that stepped up, and the only two that stepped up, to say we will do the testing of it. One of the reasons why more universities didn't step, to step up to do it, because it's still a federally illegal drug. And a lot of the universities and colleges get funding from the feds. So that becomes a problem and a conflict. So they haven't stepped up to do that. But these two did. And they will do the testing <coughs> on the various, various types of things that are in it. You know, the, the, what the components are in marijuana and what the levels of, of fertilizer and pesticides are. There are two, three private testing labs right now, as you can see here listed out. Those three will be there too. They went ahead and opened it up since they didn't get as many uh, uh, public universities or public entities to do it. So we now have five testing sites that will be measuring what's happening in the marijuana supply in the state of Ohio. 
The next step is then we go to the dispensary. So we've, we've cultivated it, we've sent it to the processing, we've tested it. Now we're going to go to um, the dispensaries. There originally set out that we were going to have 56 or 60 dispensaries in the state of Ohio. Right now we're only going to have 56 because in one area of the state there, was, there were no applications. People just didn't uh, apply to have a dispensary there. So rather than just adding those dispensaries to another part of the state, they held them back so that in case in the future someone wanted to put one down there, they would have that maximum open. Um, right now there's only nine certificates of operation, so there's not a lot of dispensaries going on. I believe up in this part of the country there's several that are moving and, and growing, and I think a couple in Cincinnati, but there's a lot of parts in the state of Ohio that don't have dispensaries at this time. They have to, have, they have to be open um, a minimum of, uh, well, basically they have to be open a minimum of 35 hours a week. And they can have those hours anytime from 7 in the morning to 9 at night. And when we were in the Marijuana Advisory Commission, that was a huge discussion because uh, originally they wanted it only open from 7 to 7 or 7 to 6. And people said that wouldn't work for people who are working. And so it, it is a little bit longer time now. But they have to be open at least 35 hours a week. And it doesn't matter what day of the week and how they do it, but as long as people can get access to, to the... Um, marijuana, therapeutic marijuana. Um, there has to be at least two employees at the site at all time, no drive throughs can't consume it on site, uh, and again, that 500 feet rule falls into place, and no uh, uh, drive throughs and no um, delivery. The dispensary districts really were not just randomly chosen about where they were. This is the formula that they, they chose to do it, and I have to say that the state of Ohio uh, has really done a, an incredibly good job of trying to think through every process that, that they have to make sure that it's fair and equitable and done correctly and safely. They had safety and transparency and all of those things in mind first. And I, I have to say that I agree that they have done that. So they had to look at uh, you know, patient populations, um, um, Ohio's population, existing compliance resources for the state pharmacy boards, all these types of things, roadways, all types of things to make sure that, that Ohio was covered adequately. And then this is how it broke, has broken out. So this is where you can see where the districts are, and then within the districts there are other districts within that. So we can get to the point where here in Northeast Ohio you should have 18 dispensaries up in this area in the yellow. In your area, I believe. And are we in the yellow? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have to double check to make sure that green got kind of big. So um, that's the dispensaries. Right now, uh, when they started out, they had 376 applications for 60 spots. And they awarded those in May of last year. And, um, and as I said, there'll be no uh, additional applications for the three regions, so there will only be 57 at this point. Uh, in the state of Ohio, and they're all in the process of being uh, opened up at this point, so they're, they'll be on the way pretty soon. The other thing that people ask us about is what's the reciprocity, because we have Michigan right next door, and they've had legal uh, therapeutic marijuana for a long time, or a relatively long time, so can we go across there? Because then we also kind of believe that there's things bleeding across that line. I mean, we'd be kind of naive if we didn't believe that, but it is bleeding across that line. And right now we are in negotiations and they're actively um, pursuing that with the state of Michigan. They've actually, have, the state of Ohio has actively pursued it with every state that has a marijuana medical program because they want to be able to do that reciprocity. It turns out to be so much more complicated than anyone would believe because our medical marijuana law looks different than Michigan's marijuana law and trying to get the two of those to come together to make some sense while it's still illegal federally causes a lot of problems. So I know that there's a lot of patients that are thinking, why can't they just get it done? But there's a lot of legality that has tied this up and it won't happen. The piece from where I come as a prevention specialist is that we don't want this in the hands of children. That truly is the, the, the biggest problem. Children. Brains are still developing, and when marijuana or any substance is put on a child's brain, 
it has the potential to alter, change that brain, rewire that brain. That may have long-lasting consequences, and I'm sure the doctor is more than ready and able to talk about that. But what the law in Ohio did was try to address this so that those chances of a child accidentally getting this are as minimized as much as possible. So they're not allowed to use cartoon characters uh, or fictional characters or pulp co or pop culture characters in any kind of their advertising or labeling or um, whatever they would be out there with. It can't resemble commercial candies, for sure. And there's many, I don't have a picture of it here, but in, when it first got started out in Colorado, there were very famous, well-known brands of candy that they changed the name on, but made the, uh, minorly changed the name on, and made the packaging look just like a Hershey bar or a butternut bar, and it was filled with marijuana. Now, that's a danger for our children. I mean, there, it's, there's just no excuse. To my way, there's no excuse for that. That's just, um, that's beyond the pale to me. So um, the design, bears, animals, characters, all those things cannot be used. And anything that would target to a child or to a person younger than 18 has to, uh, cannot happen. And they have actually a control panel set up at the state to review everything, every advertisement, every packaging, everything that goes out to see if it meets the, the level of what their expectations are. You can't even have flavors for vaporization that are, you know, those fun kind of flavors. So they have to be pretty much, you know, you're just basic sort of uh, average flavors, not like strawberry delight or whatever that might be. So um, they have put all that. <coughs> and again, here we go on the product labeling and packaging. Uh, certainly childproof. There's a standard for childproof packaging at the federal level that they are supposed to meet. Um, and every, every label should have on it the strain, the information, the weight, the grams, where it was tested, what the CBD is in it content, what the THC content is in it. When it expires, it's only good for a year, then it expires. And then we have to work with the state of Ohio is working how to destroy or get rid of the um, <coughs> product that has been um, outdated at that point. So that there's another system for that on the package. I'm not quite sure how that works with the FDA because you know, eating foods that haven't gone through it. So here's a pat, some of the warning labels that you might be able to, to be looking for on it, but we certainly feel it's important for um, the person that is taking this to understand what they are taking. It is used as medicine and therefore should be treated as medicine. So you should know what's going in your body Ideally, you should know what the effects or the side effects will be when you're taking it. I'm not sure that happens in the medical marijuana world, but it's important for people to do that. And then we need to make sure that it's, um, it stays locked up, used as it's supposed to be used, and then disposed of properly when you're done with it. Advertising, here's a few more things, you know, out in the communities, and I tell people who are prevention specialists or community members, if you have marijuana in your community, these are things that you should look at and monitor. You should make sure that they're not within 500 feet advertising of a prohibited facility. You may make sure that you don't see anything that looks like it's targeted children. You can't have billboards. So if you see a billboard, uh-uh, not going to happen. You can't hear it be advertised on the radio or broadcast. Uh, they can't even stand outside a public place and hand out literature to people try to draw people in, that's not allowed. And it's not allowed on public transportation systems like the big sign on the side of the bus. That can happen as well. And these are the things that, as we monitor this program, are to be important for all of us to take a look at. And here's just a, a few more things that, uh, uh, that we talk about is that in the advertising piece of it, and these are kind of common sense things, but certainly are things that, again, we should all take a look at. No, no merchandise, no apparel. No false or misleading statements, and there are false and misleading statements. Let me tell you this. From, from the research and the literature, and I've read a lot, maybe not everything, but I've read a lot, I've never heard marijuana to cure one thing. And you'll hear that out there, that it cures cancer. And what a disservice that is to people who may have cancer. So I think you have to be careful. It does not, it may, you know, there are properties within marijuana that show, that show promise, but there is uh, no cures going on uh, 
with something as significant and as dangerous as, as cancer. Physicians. A physician has to be uh, an active uh, physician in good standing. It can have no restrictions on his or her license. Uh, it can be an osteopathic pathic medicine or, or uh, a regular medicine, regular MDs and ODs can t do it. Um, they have to be available to get into uh, a, a pretty sophisticated um, database system and they enter the patient's information and drag them <coughs> into that. They can't have any disciplinary actions. Uh, they have to be take two hours of approved continuing medical education about marijuana. And that's all it takes to get your ability, your CTR certification to recommend is two hours. Boy, I fought long and hard in this too because you're going to be a half hour short by the time you leave here tonight to be able to rec recommend marijuana. <laughs> Just go another half hour and you're good to go. So um, I think it's, uh, it, that's something that, that there's just so many unknowns about this. And, and we want the patients to be cared for and make sure that they're well. But that's what they need to do. And that's the law. And that's the way it is at this point. Um, they have the 21 conditions uh, that they can uh, elaborate on. They have to have a complete relationship with their their patient, that means it's an ongoing relationship where they get to um, understand the condition that the person is, and it has to be one of the 21 that's on the list. Uh, they can't have any ownership in a marijuana company. Um, the, uh, the Ohio Medical Board is the one that approves it all. We want to make sure that they're geogra geographically uh, around the state of Ohio. And um, right now, the number of Physicians just went up today uh, before I before I could change this. There's 448 physicians now in the state of Ohio, but the majority of them are not recommending marijuana yet. They're just not. So we're not quite sure what what's what's happening there. And we're also realizing that a lot of the, the uh, doctors are doctors that are working out of clinics. So I kind of figured this would happen. So if your doctor may have the the, the CTR thing but uh, a lot of them don't. They're doctors who are now coming together in clinics that do just that, and especially in Central Ohio and, and beyond, is that they, they come together and this is the clinic that you come to to see a doctor that will to recommend marijuana to you. So that feels a little bit less like what we thought this law was trying to get at than it is now, and that kind of feels a little bit like pill mill doctors, but um, we'll have to watch it and make sure that there aren't uh, any problems with that. Again, community work to make sure that the patient and the public is protected. Here are your qualifying conditions. They have, uh, I think it's every two years, uh, but they started in November through the end of December. They opened it up again to receive re uh, recommendations from the public and from doctors and from whomever, anybody, everybody, about what other conditions might be added to this list. And it was very interesting. They had, uh, uh, and unfortunately I didn't grab that slide, but they had a number of conditions, maybe, uh, I won't even throw it out there, but they came down to basically nine, nine that they felt were uh, <clears throat> proper ones to at least research. And they're bringing in a team of experts from around the country, so we've been told, to take a look and analyze the conditions to see if there's any um, reason that they might be good for using uh, having mar uh, therapeutic marijuana. So uh, the biggest one, the two that I think we should uh, figure out is, is that it's going to be, they're looking at using it for opioids to make sure to get people off of opioids. There's a lot of conflicting information on that. Uh, another one is autism. Those were a couple things. So I, and I regret that I didn't get that slide in here. But the, there are some things, and at this point, they're still examining. They picked the ones that did not have promise, and they're examining those. And um, we'll see what that happens. But I think, again, yeah, if it's not next year, it'll be the year after, they'll open it up again to do that, that information. So here's the patient. Here's the registration fees for him and a caregiver. You have to, as I said, the, the bona fide relationship with your doctor. Uh, proof, you have to be an Ohio citizen. You have to prove it. You get your card for a year, and then you have to renew it. Uh, you can get a 90-day supply, we talked about that, uh, and you can carry your registration card with you at all times. 
and you have to have your marijuana in the original packaging so that if you get into a situation where perhaps you have a traffic uh, citation and they find the marijuana in your card, if you can pull out the packaging and your, your card, then you won't have really any problems with that. Now, some people were talking about today in a meeting was that about kind of the underground piece of this going on. And um, we have heard and I've seen that there is uh, a movement out there to try to educate some people to get your initial supply and then buy your, your supply on the black market and but you still have your original package. And so you can just put it in the back package. So there's, there's a number of people that are gonna play by the rules and there's a number of people that probably won't play by the rules. We're seeing that now. Right now we have 22,000, more than 22,000 uh, recommendations and only 19,000, a little more than 19,000 women have actually activated their registration. So there's a, there's a <coughs> kind of a blip there about what, what's happening and then there's even, even a glitch of, um, between those who've registered and those who've actually purchased the product. So I think there's only like a, a third of the patients that have their registration are not purchasing marijuana yet at this point. So we'll see uh, how it all plays out as the program continues to progress. Caregivers, you have to be uh, 21 years or, or older. Uh, and then the parents, we talked about the 18th and they changed that now so that slide needs updated. You can be younger than that if you're a parent. Uh, patient can have only two caregivers. Caregivers can only have two patients, 90 days supply. We've talked about all that. There's 973 caregivers now registered in the state of Ohio. Control and support, we've talked about that. I'm not going to spend any time on that slide. And uh, that's kind of where the program is right now. That's the, the guts of it, how it was put together and built and done. Uh, and there's a lot of pieces then to that that we all need to take a look at. So I'll be anxious to answer any questions you might have afterwards. Thank you, Marcy. Appreciate it. Presenter is Dr. Uh, Lori Keeney, MD. She's the Chief Medical Officer and Medical Director uh, for uh, Community Hospice here in Tuscarawas County. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering, she graduated from Wright State University School of Medicine, and completed her family residency at Barberton Citizen Hospital. She spent the last 24 years practicing family medicine in the New Philadelphia area has been a member of the Union Hospital, uh, well, now it's Cleveland Clinic Union Hospital, if I get that right, uh, medical staff since coming to the area, and has also <coughs> served as chairman of the family practice department, as well as vice president and president of the medical staff. She's a board certified in hospice and palliative care. Laura? All right. <laughs> how to move this to the next one. Hmm. Hey, Dave. No. No, I got it. Oh, we got it. I'm, T I'm IT challenge, so just bear with me. Okay, <laughs> full screen now. Hit Okay. Got it. All right. And now the little white. Thing. There you go. I left it for you, Marcy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can you guys hear me with this? I'm not too much of a mover because I'll fall over. So anyhow, so so I thought Marcy did all the laws, and so I thought I'd try and do a little bit of what we know from the medicine aspect and the pharmacy aspect. Do I have any pharmacists out there? Any farm techs? No help. Oh, I do have somebody. Okay, good. All right. Um, so is it medicine or are we in the weeds? And I don't know that we've answered that question yet, so we'll see what you guys think. So what do we know? Um, marijuana comes from the cannabis stevia plant, the female plant. Um, like Marcy said, there's over 400 compounds. Some places say 800 compounds, and there are pharmacists here. I recognize them now. Um, OK. So the biggest components that, that we look at medically are the CBD, the cannabinoid, um, cannabidiol, and the delta tetrahydrocannabinol, the THC, which is what we'll call it now. Um, there are many other compounds in it. Some of them are active and <coughs> some of them are not. And in all honesty, we do not know what they all are. Um, in my first, there's a typo up there. So from about 2800 BC, hemp was used for rope and fiber in ancient China. 
probably around 2000 BC, we started to see it used for a variety of medical ailments. They smoked it for everything. And then uh, first in China and then later in India. So anxiety, pain, all those things that you hear about nowadays, that's what they use it for. It, it evolved and got over into the Middle East, the Far East, Africa, Egypt, about 200 AD, and then was brought into Western medicine from India in about the 1800s. So most of the therapeutic use stopped in the earliest 20th century, mostly because we went to drugs that were um, synthesized. So we didn't want you know, a weed, we wanted a drug that we could consistently make and we knew exactly what was in it, so all of our medicines today are made in the factory for the most part. Um, and then there was uh, legislation that outlawed it or made it, made it illegal for recreational use. So the endocannabinoid system, which we won't say again because it's a big word, but this is how the compounds that are in marijuana interact with your body, your endocrine system. So we know that there are different receptors. There are CBD, CB1 receptors that you find throughout the central nervous system, in the brain, in your fat tissues, in your connective tissues. Um, in your uterus and testicles, if you have those. Um, action at this uh, site decreases nerve excitability. So that starts to make sense as to why it maybe has a common effect, helps with seizures, spasms, some of those things that we have heard and know people are using it for. Um, there is also a CBD2 uh, receptor that we know of, and this is more affecting immune cells. So your B cells, your, your T cells, um, a lot of cells in the liver and spleen because they're the ones responsible for making B and T cells. Also, there's a lot of immune cells in your gut, which is why probiotics and those kind of things have become uh, more important as we learn. So these modulate the immune systems, which is why we think they help with inflammation, Crohn's disease, inflammatory conditions, and with pain. Um, THC has, works on both of those sites. Um, somewhat as an antagonist, some, some as an agonist, but anyhow, so the THC we know promotes muscle relaxation, decreased pain, um, and nausea, but it can cause anxiety, sedation, and even psychosis in some, in some folks. Which is why when kids or people smoke pot, you get that high, weird, you know, things look weird, things taste funny, all that kind of thing. So, Cannabis based drugs, all of them, are Schedule I from the DEA in the United States of America, which means they're illegal in any shape or form. Schedule I drugs, by definition, have no proven medical benefit and a high likelihood of harm or addictive tendency. So, right now, that's the definition that marijuana falls under. Um, so, all of our state laws that allow medical marijuana fly in the face of the DEA, DEA Schedule I. Now, is there an argument, should it be Schedule One? Should it not? That's an argument, and there's, there's good arguments on both sides. But for right now, it is a Schedule One. It's illegal. Um, so physicians cannot prescribe marijuana. That puts me right in jail in an orange suit. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> So there are some, there has been recognized that marijuana or the, or the compounds in marijuana could have some medical uses. And so there are three products that have gone through all the FDA testing and all the trials and have been brought to market that actually are out there and available that are legal to use in the United States because they've gone through the FDA. Uh, Dronabinol, which is the old Marinol capsules, also known as Syndros liquid. Um, it's human-made THC and it's a Schedule Three. Excuse me. Um, you may have, this from anybody who's a little bit older, your younger ones won't, but when we had the AIDS epidemic back in the 80s, this came out for people who had AIDS-related anorexia, which means they lost their appetite. So this was to stimulate appetite. Um, also used for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Still used today, comes in a pill or, like I said, a liquid. Um, also sesame, um, same thing, only different, um, approved for the chemotherapy-related nausea and vomiting. And our newest one, which you guys will probably send in the paper, whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce, Epidiolex, um, is synthetic CBD, and it is, um, they're using it in childhood seizure disorders, which is what Dravet syndrome is, very specific <coughs> infantile seizure, but in other seizure disorders also. So these three are available through the FDA that your doctor can prescribe. 
So this we kind of already went through, so I won't beat it. Um, so we had it introduced, the deadlines for rules, the deadlines for operations, and we had our first dispensary open in January 2019 in Wintersville, Ohio. <laughs> Go figure that out. Um, so physicians can become certified to recommend medical marijuana. Two hours of training, two, count them, two. She almost knows as much as I do when you leave. Um, not really, I've studied a little bit more, but two hours of training. Um, so, like Marcy said, the patient physician are supposed to establish a relationship, evaluate the patient, their records for the appropriate diagnoses, and if you feel that this is something, if that physician feels that this would be a helpful thing, they can make a recommendation. So you, they, they put your data in the database, in the Ohio database, goes off to the control, Medical Marijuana Control Board. They look at it, make sure all the proper stuff is there, the diagnosis is correct, and then they contact the patient and say, yes, you're approved, no, you're not approved, um, and the patient can get their card. Um, for the average bear, um, the average patient, this is it's a one-year card, and you can have two caregivers also get cards that can help you go pick up your medical marijuana or help you to take your medical marijuana. If you're a hospice patient, it's a six-month um, it's only a six month limit and it can be renewed every six months. The others are renewed every year. So the qualifying conditions we already kind of took a quick look at. Um, AIDS, Lou Gehrig's disease, <coughs> Alzheimer's, cancer, brain injuries, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, epilepsy or other <coughs> disorders, fibromyalgia, glaucoma, <coughs> all you guys can read. Um, and the products that are approved. So plant solids and oils for edibles and vaping, tinctures, capsules and edibles, patches, lotions, ointments, oral sublingual, topical vaping, no smoking in, this, in the state of Ohio. Smoking, combusting marijuana is still an illegal activity. Um, the tiers of medical marijuana, <coughs> marijuana we talked about, uh, 0 to 23%, that's still a lot. The, 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 what's on the street now is probably about 12 or 13%. What it was back in the 70s was 4 or 5%. So it's a big change. This is a pretty psychoactive group here. And then tier 2. When I took my education about a year ago, they mentioned that there might be a tier 3, but apparently that didn't <coughs> play out. So um, The interesting thing to me as a physician, um, is that your physician will not decide, the physician that you see that recommends marijuana for you and puts you in the database, will not decide what form or dose of medical marijuana you receive for your condition. They will only certify that you have a, one of those 21 conditions and that they recommend it for your situation. That you've maybe tried other things that have failed, but that they think you know, it should be recommended. Other than that, that's, that's all we get to say. <coughs> Um, so then you go to your dispensaries where there's bud tenders. They have six hours of education. <laughs> six. That's less than a day in medical school. That's less than a day in high school. Six hours. Okay, and then they can dispense a 90-day supply. They're going to pick what strength you get, they're going to pick what form you get, and they're going to hand it to you and say, good luck, see you soon. And as far as I know in the law, there is no... Um, follow-up that they have to do. So if you come to me and you have high blood pressure and I put you on hydrochlorothiazide, which is a common water pill, I'll probably see you back in a month or six weeks. See if it's working, see if you're having any side effects, maybe do some blood work, make sure I haven't messed up your kidneys or your potassium. These guys are going to hand you 90 days and say, see you later. Okay. That as a physician is alarming to me. And it should be alarming to you, not because I don't think, I think that medical marijuana has a place. I do. I think there are uses for it. I think in hospice and palliative medicine, which is what I do now, there are probably many uses for it when we run out of other options from medicines we know and understand. But as a patient, I don't know that I'd want somebody to hand me 90 days and say, good luck. I really would want them to check back with me to say, hey, is this working? You know, am I having any side effects? We know, um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the adverse effects. You can get depression from this. So if you're already depressed and anxious, this can actually make you worse instead of better. As we know, most of the antidepressants we use 
can make it worse instead of better. That's why you do a follow-up. Um, can cause anxiety, disorientation, hallucinations, <coughs> paranoia, suicidal ideation, dizziness, drowsiness, blurred vision, appetite changes, nausea, um, palpitations, tachycardias, elevated blood pressures, lower blood pressures. So a lot of different things. A lot of medicine inter interactions, many. Uh, we know that the um, CBD and THC are mostly processed through your liver when it's coming out. Um, many, many of the drugs that we give you for medicine um, are also processed through the liver. There's a, there's a cytochrome P450 system, and that is a very common system for drugs to be processed through in your liver, and that's what this goes through, in addition to three or four others. But that's one of the main ones. So most of the seizure medicines go through there, which means it can interact with your seizure medicines. If you're on a seizure medicine and you're also using med mer medical marijuana, it may lower your seizure drugs. It may make them build up too high, both of which are not good. Um, it also interacts with some antibiotics, especially like Zithromax, which is a very common one people get nowadays, um, clarithromycin, which is biaxin, uh, erythromycin. Most of the antifungals also are very much used, um, metabolized in your liver, and it interacts with those. <coughs> Many of the antidepressants, several heart medications, uh, the breast cancer medications that you stay on long term, like tamoxifen, all go through the same system. So if you're going to use medical marijuana, you need to be very aware of what else you're on, and I hope your bud tender who dispenses it would be too. And that's what they call them bud tenders, honest to God. I didn't make that up. Honestly, I did not make that up. Um, so American College of Cardiology came out two years ago and said, this was a quote out of their literature, using marijuana raises the risk of stroke and liver failure. Now I didn't go and look and see where they got all their information at, but if, if they came out with a statement like that, I'm sure that they did their research. Um, there is cannabinoid withdrawal syndrome. Um, usually starts in 24 to 72 hours. Kind of depends on how much and how often you use. Peaks in a week, um, irritability, nervousness, anxiety, sleep disturbances. It's like coming off an antidepressant. If, if anybody's ever stopped an antidepressant suddenly, sometimes <coughs> you feel like you've almost got the flu. You're anxious, you're jittery, you're moody, you get sweats and chills. So you really can withdraw from marijuana also. And the biggest caution, and, and this is why Marcy's here and she was hit on this, is our kids. Um, when I was a kid, really doesn't work real well for medical marijuana. It's a whole different animal plant. Um, you know, 4% THC versus <coughs> what's in this is a whole different world. And we just don't know that much about it. Because it's a Schedule One drug in the United States by the DEA, it takes about 15 permits and a lot of money to do any kind of a study on it. The only place that it's growing in the United States of America that you can access for medical um, testing and trials is the University of Mississippi. They have the whole kit and caboodle. And there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of money to get access to that. And in all honesty, it just really hasn't been done a whole lot. Now you can look outside the United States, but if you're sick and you live in Canada, you usually come to the United States for your medical care. If you're in the Middle East, the Shah of Iran spent his last so many months on the third floor of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so generally people look to us to be the leader. So I'm not sure, and not that other places don't do good medicine, I'm not saying that, but it's very, very different than what we've come to expect in the United States of America. Um, so we have to protect our kids. You need to think about their health and certainly their development. And we, you, you have to address this issue early and often. Is it fun? Absolutely not. I have a 15 year old. We have some really interesting conversations <laughs> sometimes, but I'm not gonna let it go. He's my responsibility and I want him to make good decisions. So we talk about this stuff. We talk about all kinds of things. And you really, really are, even though your 15 year old turns their nose up at you and most of the time is busy doing this and you're not even sure they're really hearing what you're saying, you are still the most powerful influence in your child's life. So what you think about this and the conversations at your dinner table or the conversations in your kitchen or with your neighbor, they hear that and they know what you think 
and what you, what you say and what you do. Um, so the consequences for our kids, and we had these stats before. So studies suggest about 9% of people who use medical marijuana will become dependent on it. 17% or one in six if they start as a teen. Um, and their brains are not fully developed until age 24. That's why they were cute when they were small. <laughs> I, use that, I tell my son that frequently. If he does something, I'll say, you know, you were cute when you were small. And that is the only thing that's saving you right this minute because they're just goofy. They, they do goofy, stupid stuff, and it's because their brains are not totally developed, and they just don't have that, gee, maybe this is a bad idea. You know, they've watched too many of those, hold my beer commercials, and then they splatter themselves on the wall, and you think, anyhow, 15-year-olds do that, and they don't even need the beer. Um, so, short-term side effects, problems with memory and learning. What's your 15-year-old or your 12-year-old's primary responsibility in the world? learning, going to school and learning so that later they can function as a citizen. So if we're impairing their learning, we just shot them in the foot. Um, not only just because they're going to get bad grades, but because when they're 25, they're not going to know what they needed to learn when they were, that they've been building on all along. So we shot them in the foot. Um, so it distorts perception. Anybody that's ever smoked marijuana, drank some alcohol, anything else that distorts your perception, you make bad decisions when your perception is distorted. Whether it's because you can't see it quite right, or you're just a little less thinking about what those bad decisions might lead to, you make bad choices. Teenagers can make bad choices without any help. I mean, if we help, I mean, if you let them do this kind of stuff or think that this is not a bad thing, it's just setting them up for danger. Um, trouble thinking and problem solving makes them incoordinated. Incoordinated, so uncoordinated, they're gonna get hurt easier. Increases their heart rate and makes them more anxious. And there's a lot of anxious teens already out there right now. Social media is a whole new world and it makes anxious teens. In the long term, it, they don't develop good coping mechanisms. If they start using substances, whether it's marijuana or alcohol or whatever, in their youth because they're stressed out or they're sad or they're frustrated, then they don't learn how to cope with those things in a healthy manner. So what do they do when they get older? They just run to the drug. And as they get older, they run to a harder drug and a harder drug because what used to work with the little stresses of middle school and high school don't work with the big stresses of they're coming to take your car and your house away next week because you didn't pay your bills. Um, so if you get on the website for the Anti-Drug Coalition, they have a wonderful marijuana talk kit um, that really kind of helps you bring it up with your kids and how to talk to them and how not to talk to them. So just be mindful of what you portray for your kids, your own usage, your attitude, your attitude towards usage very much influences your, your kids and the others you spend time with. So I'll stop there because I know we want to have some time for questions. And I don't know how to do this, so I'll <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lori. Appreciate the presentation. Now, as I said at the beginning on the format, uh, you were given uh, three by five cards with a pen, pen, and if you have any questions, uh, hopefully you've written them down, and we have anti-drug coalition staff, so if you raise those up and move them towards the center of the, uh, they'll, they'll collect those and they'll bring those up to me. Uh, our panel, we're going to add an additional person to our panel. It's Jody Salvo. She is the Director of Prevention Services at Personal and Family Counseling Services. She holds a, a Master's in Social Work with Marywood University and is a certified prevention consultant. She oversees the school-based substance abuse prevention education, youth-led programming, and coordinates uh, the uh, anti-drug coalition. And quite frankly, she's my boss. <laughs> um, uh, Jody is currently thank you. Jody is currently uh, the current chair of the Ohio Statewide Prevention Coalition Association and is committed to strengthening uh, uh, yeah, families and communities. So with that being said, um, start off with uh, some questions that we have. Uh, this is for uh, Dr. Keeney. 
Uh, what is the difference between the CBD found online and in the community versus what you get at the dispensaries? Okay. So at the dispensaries, it should be exactly, I mean, they should label it and you should know exactly what is in there versus if you buy it on Amazon or from your buddy, you really don't know what's in there. And the problem being that there is THC contamination in a lot of the stuff that's out there not coming from a dispensary. So if you get drug tested or, you know, at work, you're going to have THC, which is what a urine drug test tests for, um, and you're going to have used marijuana even if you didn't. Um, so that's an issue. Plus, you don't know what impurities are in it. You, you really have no idea what you're getting when, you, when you're buying in some place other than the dispensary. Can everybody here in the back the answers? Okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, I guess uh, this will go to Marcy. Uh, the public has some confusion surrounding the issue of medical marijuana and workplace policies by business. Uh, could you talk and give us some clarification on this issue? Um, the state of Ohio, the law is written so that the, Marcy, can you? you All right. <laughs> um, the, the law has written into it that it allows all uh, employers to make their own policy. They don't have to accommodate for medical marijuana. So if you don't, if your employer says, no, we're not going to have that within our, our workplace, you're not allowed to have it, then that's, that's exactly what they're, that, that it can be. So there is a lot of confusion around that, and there'll be a lot of testing on that as, as we move forward. But for right now, the best thing to do is ask your employer what their policy is so that you know straight up what it is. If you're thinking about becoming a patient, you probably ought to do that before you start taking it. Um, so that you know, you know, if they don't allow it, then, then you're in trouble. If they do allow it, then you work that out with your employer. Uh, just, uh, Marcy, a follow-up one that would be, uh, from a workers' compensation stance or even state-approved insurance provided to state employees, is medical marijuana now something that is paid and reimbursed under those systems? I don't know if you can answer that. Here. I can. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because it's still a federally illegal drug, and it's not recognized as being, uh, has gone through the testing process that all of our other drugs go through. So there's no way that the Bureau of Worker Comp is going to uh, allow that. And certainly insurance companies, again, because it cannot be prescribed, it only can be recommended. It therefore cannot go through uh, insurance. Um, this would be for Jody. Uh, what is the anti-drug coalition's concern about the Ohio's medical marijuana program? Uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, the Anti-Drug Coalition, our mission is to prevent and reduce youth substance use. Um, so really what we work on in the community is what do we need to know about substances that our students are faced with. And one thing we know is what is effective to prevent youth substance use. And one, Dr. Keeney said that beautifully, that parental voice is the most effective thing. And I'll just let you know, I'm really glad you all are here because it is a confusing system. It's confusing to know THC gets you high, CBD might not get you high, um, what's its use for, and what happens if we as adults cannot communicate to our kids some of the concerns, such as THC is much more potent than it used to be, one in six kids can become addicted to um, marijuana products, if we're not saying that to our kid, what they're hearing right now in our nation, in our state, is marijuana is medicine, is curing everything, it's helpful for everything. We hear messages, safe. it's safe, it's safer than. Um, we hear students all the time, well, my parent thinks it's safer than alcohol. And you know what, we're not gonna get in debates of safer than. A lot of times when we work with students, we kind of give this analogy. Would it be safe to drive 120 miles an hour on a country road in Tuscarawas County? And what will they say? No. Well, then we say, well, would it be safer if we put a seat belt on and went 120? And they're like, well, yeah, that'd be a little bit safer, but is it safe? 
So trying to help adults just be able to communicate with the kids, you know, there is a potential for addiction for youth. It's much higher than adults because your brains are not developed yet. And it also gets in the issue that we've just had the opiate epidemic, the crisis in our state. And some of the concerns from a prevention standpoint is our kids just feel a doctor prescribed it so it's safe for them. So they do not necessarily say the misuse of prescription drugs the same as they would the misuse of street drugs or the use of street drugs. So we need to take that same lessons learned to say our kids' brains just process information differently than ours. So they can very easily think, well, this is safer than. Um, so just having an understanding of our, our voice matters to our kids, helping them understand this issue is just very helpful for our kids. So from the Anti-Drug Coalition, it really is to educate adults so we can educate our kids so we're making healthy choices. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Keeney, question for you. How does a recommendation differ from a regular prescription you get from a doctor? Okay, and I did touch on that just a little bit. So a regular prescription, you know, we write it. It's been through all the FDA tests. It, it should be safe. Now, do we see drugs on TV every day that says, you know, bad drug, call, call this lawyer? Absolutely. So even after they've been through testing with thousands and thousands and thousands of patients, there's still some things that happen when it gets out into the market into more thousands of patients that we didn't anticipate. And so then you get bad drug. So what about marijuana, who's not been through any real testing? We have no clue. No clue. Um, so you can look at Israel and you can look at some other places. And you can look at states that have had it legal. Those are still pretty minuscule numbers. And you, you can look at your friends. Okay, so you have, let's say you know 100 people that smoke marijuana every day and nothing bad's happened to them. Well, okay, but what about the 4 billion when you apply it to 4 billion? It, your 100 doesn't matter anymore. I had a pharma, or I, had a, I was learning at a lecture once and I said, well, you know, I've had this and this and a couple of patients. He said, I don't really care what you've seen in your 4,000 patient population of, that you take care of in Tuscarawas County, Ohio. We're looking at the United States of America, and your little experience doesn't mean jack squat here. And so I've always taken that to heart because I thought, well, when you look at the great big picture, my little experience doesn't mean jack squat, which means neither does yours or your friends or your neighbors. Um, it's that big picture when you apply to the big group. And so to not know is pretty scary. I mean, if, if if you think we take FDA drugs every day that still have really bad side effects and really have unexpected side effects that kill people sometimes, but we're willing to vape, rub, whatever, marijuana, and, and in all honesty, the biggest groups of people that I've seen studies on have smoked it. And we're not even offering that in the state of Ohio. And that, that's where most of the medical data in the literature is, is smoking it, inhaling it, not vaping it, not rubbing it on, not anything else. So you just don't know what you're going to get. And, and there's no follow-up. That's the thing I think that scares me the most. Um, am, do I think there might be value in it? I do think there might be value. It's, like I said, especially for a hospice patient or somebody who's an end of life, who's miserable and in pain. And in a lot of other places, I think there's, there's good data for the seizures. There's good data probably for spasm. Um, so I think there are uses. What scares me is the way we're doing it in the state of Ohio that I can hand you, nine, or they can hand you 90 days with no consultation really with a physician to say how much or how little, um, and that they don't check you back. They, and one of the studies I read that people who start marijuana, not smoking it, but in one of these other forms, within, within six weeks, 20% of those people will have abnormal liver enzymes, meaning your liver is having a hard time processing this stuff. Which means if you get sick and it affects your liver, or you get put on another drug, because, another medication, because you go back to your family doctor or whoever and start something else, and they and that adds insult to injury because it's processed through the liver too, you could be in a ton of trouble. And it's a, it takes a long time to get a liver transplant in the United States of America, so try not to need one. Um, and, and that's another point. If you are going to be involved with medical marijuana. Please, please let your primary care provider know that. It, you know they're not going to judge you if that if that's something you need to use for your pain or your spasm, and, and you want to give that a try. That's grand. 
but make them aware, say, know that I'm using medical marijuana and this is what I'm using and this is how much THC it's got in it, so that when they choose medications to put you on, they don't mess you up worse um, by putting you on something that's going to, you know, process in the same route that may cause it to build up, that may cause the levels of their medicines to drop and really cause you serious harm. Okay. Next question I have is and probably for Marcy. Who regulates prices at dispensary? And I hit uh, something in here about $48 for 2.87 grams. But who regulates the prices at the dispensary? Free market. So it's supply and demand. So uh, right now it's high because there's a very limited supply because we only have a certain number of dispensaries that are open. And then once then once um, more dispensaries get, or more cultivators produce more product, product and more dispensaries are open, there'll be more marijuana. So therefore, it will drive the price. A perfect example of that is out in uh, Oregon. Oregon has so much marijuana flooded in, and of course they are medical, well they had, they started with medical and then moved to full recreational. Uh, and, and then they just let go of the, the medical, and it's just to totally recreational because there's, there's no difference. I mean, marijuana is marijuana, so there's no difference. And so they have so much marijuana out there now, the prices are extraordinarily cheap, and then people are buying it and selling it back here at a higher price, so there's the black market is flourishing. So when they say, legalize it, you know, and we, we'll take care of the black market, yeah, it hasn't worked out really well yet. So um, it's, it is, it's a free market. Can I ask, do you know what physicians are charging in general for the uh, CM for certificate recommendation? No. Because that's free market also. Exactly, and I don't know. So that's not something that med uh, that your insurance is going to cover if you go see somebody for a certificate of recommendation. So they can charge you anything they want. So if it's a $500 visit or a $250 visit or a $25 visit, that's totally up to the physician. And it's not, it's going to be out of pocket yeah. cash pay. They're not going to take insurance. Um, so. Yeah. Um, this one, I believe we've covered this a little bit about one of the conditions. The, the question is, uh, chronic pain is one of the 21 conditions uh, because pain is subjective. Um, uh, can anyone receive a recommendation for medical marijuana from a physician by claiming to have chronic pain? <coughs> Well, okay, so you're supposed to have a relationship with the physician uh, who's going to certify you to recommend marijuana. Um, they're supposed to, if they're, if they're not your regular doctor, which most of them probably won't be, um, they're supposed to review your medical records and, and make sure that that diagnosis is proved out as much as it can be. Now, with chronic pain, whoever wrote that question is 100% right. It's, it's subjective. So can you prove it? Probably not. So you, can, you can't prove fibromyalgia. You can't prove CT. chronic traumatic brain injury. Every NFL player until you're dead. will be here yeah, until you're dead. They bob to your brain. Um, so there's, a, there's several of those conditions, let's say, that you can't prove. And pain's subjective. And, they, and pain is um, chronic, severe, or intractable. Are, is the definition in the 21 that we're supposed to use it for. Um, we're supposed, it's supposed to be recommended for, and, and you can't really prove any of that. It, it doesn't mean people don't have pain, they do, but your pain's different than my pain's different than her pain. Um, and how you feel it is all subjective. Just as a side note on that, um, the, the new, and, and again, I apologize, I don't have those in front of me, the statistics, but they, they the first month that uh, recommendations were made, they, they put down what conditions got the most recommendations, you know, what it was for the recommendations for what um, the disease was. And the pain was far, far, far away above every other one as the reason that people were getting medical marijuana. Second was fibromyalgia. So, Neither of which there's a test for. Yeah. So. Um. Another question here, is there any education provided to the patients regarding driving while under the influence of medical marijuana? Uh, no. And that's one of the things that uh, certainly uh, uh, 
you know, Joni and I and, and all the other uh, uh, certified prevention specialists and, and coalition uh, leaders are looking at the state of Ohio that we need to get this out. You know, when they did the gambling piece, they, they worked into and, and legalized that. They worked into that money had to go to the education and making sure that uh, there was prevention and that there was treatment for people that got into the addictive mode of that. But they didn't do that for marijuana. And that was, too far as I can see, is the biggest problem that we have in the state of Ohio. We need, we need to have that kind of information out to people uh, to make sure. There truly are so many people that don't believe that marijuana has, medical marijuana, is has THC in it and that it can, uh, you know, cause you to you know, to become uh, intoxicated or that you don't think clearly. There's a, I, I had two legislators at the state of Ohio, one a senator and one a, a representative, that both told me this medical marijuana is great because no one gets high from it. And I, I would, I, you know, at what point do you remain respectful and at what point do you just start shaking them, you know? So um, we have to get the education out there and there's very few, if no dollars, to do that, although I am meeting uh, this week with um, some senior individuals at the state to talk about what we need to do to start educating the public. So hopefully we can break something away and get some good education out there so that people who are patients know what to expect and people who are not patients know what to expect. Marcy, can I just sure. Just a side note on that youth piece. Um, you would not believe how many students feel not only is there not a harm for them driving um, impaired by marijuana, but they will actually say, I drive better after I've used marijuana. And again, the brain is just not developed. We just did a survey at the Tuscarawas County Fair this year, and honestly, I'm not gonna throw out the stats because I don't have it clearly in my mind, but it was fairly significant. It was interesting. Our kids felt it was more addictive and harm potentially harmful than adults, but man, their driving was different than the adults. They kind of just thought, this is okay. So there is a lot of education that needs to happen out there. And it is concerning. Um, I wish our state highway patrol uh, lieutenant was here because he talks to us often about um, the OVIs that are occurring more frequently. And it used to be, I, I, it used to be in the evenings and alcohol, and now he'll say it's drug-related all day long. So that does affect all communities. And a follow-up question to that about the, uh, I'm sorry, were you in no. Oh, okay. Uh, that, and again, this is probably coming half from this question and half from me. Are they tracking the impaired driving rates in, in Ohio that have allowed medical marijuana, especially tra uh, traffic facilities? I guess, uh, is Ohio, does Ohio have set up a system in which they are going to track the statistics of the use of medical marijuana? I don't know if they're, they've specifically set up a system to do it, but they will be doing it because they do track uh, uh, driving under the influence. Uh, and uh, so no matter what the substance is, they do track it. It's harder, though, with marijuana because marijuana isn't a simple case <coughs> like for alcohol where you blow into something. Generally, you have to have a blood test. The other problem is that it's usually a polysubstance thing going on. Very rarely do you find someone driving a car that has just used marijuana or has just used alcohol. They use both or some other thing. So it gets really convoluted. But we have found in other states where they do track it, Colorado being one and Washington State being another, where that one medical or marijuana, whatever form it's in, has been legalized, the traffic rates have gone on and fatalities and crashes have gone up significantly. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've talked about this before, but um, uh, Dr. Keeney, you may want to just um, go through this again uh, to answer the question. If, if there is a medicine that, can, that has been approved through the FDA with the same effective components as marijuana, why is the legalization of the plant even an option or an issue? Well, and none, of them, none of the medicines that are out there, and some of the pharmacists that are out here can, can jump in here if I'm off. Um, they're synthetically made, so they're not the actual plant. Um, they're the chemical that's the THC that's within the plant, or the CBD that's within the plant. But they're but they're chemically they're you know synthesized in a lab instead of 
from the plant directly. And we said that that plant has 400 other compounds in it that we don't know exactly what they do. And we do think there's about 80, 60 to 80 different cannabinoids, which we know are, are medically active, but we don't know what they all do. Um, so it is, it's a, it's a different bear. It really is a different bear. Um, so the drugs that are out there are, are a cleaner, you know, they're, they're processed and they're clean and they're made in a lab as opposed to grown in a greenhouse. Um, so there are some differences there. To the, uh, this is exactly true. When you think about your medications, they've gone through a very scientific process of being, uh, and there's a, there's a, a system, and I'm not going to come up with it now, of manufacturing the, a very manufacturing protocol that makes sure that your medicine is the same each and every time you take it. So if you take the medicine in uh, New York and you fly to San Francisco and order the same medicine, it's exactly the same as what you had in New York. And you know when you read the label that there's, or that give your pharmacist gives you information, you know what the side effects are, potential side effects could be, you know what interactions with other drugs and foods could be, you know that it's uh, what the dosage is, the same size dosage each and every time. Medi marijuana is a plant and it has, as you said, so many different compounds in it and it has pesticides and it has uh, fertilizers that are, that are attached to it. So it's nothing like regular medicine. And, and our, our organization put together a white paper on this a number of years ago that said, should marijuana be medicine? And our answer is, we don't know if it should be because we haven't done enough research to be able to say so. But what if, it do, if we do find components in it that do work, then we need to put it through the process that we've done. Every other medications in the world, I have never voted on an antihistamine, or a, a, a pain pill, or a, you know, a blood, pressure blood pressure medicine. I've never voted on that. I wouldn't know how to vote on it. I wouldn't know what it was. And this is almost ludicrous to me to think that we would do this with marijuana, that we can pinpoint exactly what, what's happening in it. So I, that's the thing of it is. I agree with the doctor completely that there are components in the marijuana plant that we have good possibilities to do great medicine. And, which is like the Epidiolex, that actually has THC and other, well, more CBD in it, and it has gone through all the clinical trials. It has got all of the right dosages. It has all the right things, and why any parent would not use that drug over just giving their child the raw marijuana plant, I will never in my life understand. Um, I have one other, uh, another question here, and I think this is down in Jody's wheelhouse. It says, what can I do or who can I speak to involve myself in advocacy purposes? Well, I don't know if that was a stage question, but I'll take that. No, it wasn't. <laughs> that was that question. Um, one of the things the coalition really is poised to do is help the community take ownership of protecting our communities and our kids. If you came to any um, events recently, we're trying to do these 3 and 30 cards. So if you come to an event, we want you to walk away with something that you can do. So you did receive one of these cards when you came in today. And some of it's just very simple. It could be to go to the Ohio Medical Marijuana Commission Board and really learn a little bit more. It could be when you walk out of here tonight, if there's something you learned that you think was helpful and could be shared to other community members um, to protect our kids, please do that. One of these things on here is to talk to your kid or your grandkid or a kid that you, you're concerned about uh, that marijuana can be addicting to a youth brain and it can have some long-term negative impacts to a child. So what we would ask is look at this kind of list here um, if any of that resonates with y'all, take action. We're just saying if each of us do three things in the next 30 days to protect our kids, help them make healthy choices, because again, we're not saying that there's not potential in marijuana as medicine, but we, what we are saying is we need to have very clear conversations with our kids so they can make very good decisions. And like we said, they don't always make great clear decisions with their non-thinking brain yet. So as adults to help them make healthy choices. So what you can do is pick three of these things and do them, or you can join us in the Anti-Drug Coalition. Um, we meet once a month. Uh, our Facebook's very vibrant. We have a um, coalition website, 
And if you want to get involved, we tackle all kinds of issues from vaping, which is a hot topic right now in their, in their schools, alcohol, prescription drug misuse, and our mission and vision is to protect our kids and have a healthy thrive in Tuscarawas County. So thank you. Okay. Uh, we're coming up to a close of the forum. Uh, Jody, do you want to have anything else you, you wish to say? Uh, do we have some presentations to present? Um, well, I just want to say thank you. You both did a very wonderful job for us. And uh, Marcy drove down from Columbus today. I know she had a busy day. And Dr. Keeney, I appreciate just your information. I think it was very helpful. Did you all learn something tonight? Yes. Very good. thank our guest speakers and the panelists tonight. Hopefully you've gotten some of your questions answered. Uh, I also want to thank Kent State uh, Tuscarora's campus here for providing this wonderful uh, auditorium for this particular uh, forum. I want to thank everybody for attending. We hope you found it informative and educational. And everybody have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you.